Okay, this is Lessons of the 60s, a history of local Washington, D.C. activism for peace and justice from 1960 to 1975. It's an oral history and document archive to be housed at G G George Washington University. My name is Ann Gallivan. I'm going to be the interviewer today. Uh, Eddie Becker is our videographer. And today, Lessons of the 60s is interviewing two 60s and 70s activists. Uh, who met each other in Washington, D.C. at George Washington University in the mid-60s. Hope Boylston is a retired teacher from a Quaker school and a writer and is also a member of her local school board in Belfont, Pennsylvania. Linda Treadway is a longtime educational activist and artist. She's recently retired from teaching at Berkeley. Uh, Linda and Hope, welcome. Thank you for being part of this, this project. Um, I want to start off with a question of how did you hope and how did you, Linda, find yourself to be in Washington, D.C., and when did you get here, each one of you? Uh, I graduated from high school in 1965. I came from a privileged family and a private school in what was then a small, smallish, decadent beach town, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, my parents were very active Republicans. At that point, the extent of my rebellion in a political sense was that I read all of Ayn Rand when I was 15. Fortunately, unlike a lot of Republicans, I got over it. But, um, you know, I grew up and in front of me was the end of the rainbow. This was what we were all supposed to want, you know. Wealth and comfort and leisure and I mean, I went to the school where half the parents that I knew, where they were all like retired and they were like in their 40s. And I, I couldn't buy that as what this whole system was set up to have us strive for. So I knew there had to be something else out there. I was an avid reader. I, I knew I needed to get away and I needed to get away to a city. And uh, so I chose GW because I was interested in politics and it was secular and easy to apply to and, and I arrived. What year was that? That was 1965. Okay. And then Linda arrived. I came in, in 1966. Um, I had uh, graduated um, in 1965 from high school in a very small rural community in Nebraska and had lived on a farm my, almost my entire life um, and had gone to a Catholic girls school my first year thinking that that would make my mother happy um, and it was about as far away as I could get. I immediately started looking at other places. Um, I had always wanted to come to the East Coast. In high school I ordered all the catalogs for the Seven Sisters schools and other places uh, in fifth grade, I'd been on a debate team that said it's better to live east of the Mississippi River. And uh, it was hard to recruit people who wanted to join that, <laughs> to, uh, that team because they thought living in Nebraska was wonderful. I was interested from a very early age in politics and remember watching all the conventions on television. We got our first TV in 1952 uh, to see the Eisenhower Convention. and. Um, then I was a child of the early 60s and the whole notion of ask not what you should do for yourself but for your country of John Kennedy. Um, I was uh, interested in the news so I knew about the South. I had already been uh, reciting, making up and winning awards for American Legion speeches that talked about the Voting Rights Act. So. Politics was on my mind. I was nervous about going to New York. <laughs> there were a couple people in my town who'd been to GW, one to law school here. And so I thought, well, that seems like a good choice. So I transferred here in 1966 and we became roommates at uh, what was then called Super Dorm on GW's campus. Now in 1966 and 1965, when, when, when you arrived, what was it like for both of you? What was DC like? What was the first feeling you had when you got here? Before we start talking about what you did here, what did it feel like to transfer here, to get here? It was like this chance. You could just kind of start over. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to, you know, necessarily be who you'd been for the earlier part of your lives. And there were just so many possibilities of things 
that you could be or do. I, I had never really lived in a city, you know, and, um, and I was really lucky enough to sign up my first semester for Pat Gallagher's anthropology classes. And it was like, oh, yeah, everybody doesn't do things the same way I've been brought up. There are lots of other ways that life can be organized and lived. And some of them are, you know, sound better than ours. So that was, that was the first, that was the first chink in the Republican armor, you know? Um, and, and it gave that to me. So I, you know, I came up in a, a Catholic Christian community and actually believed the basics of Christianity, finding out later that's not exactly what they believed. But by that time, I think it was much more in my sort of consciousness and soul. I started reading Chardin as soon as I got to Washington. Uh, you know, I was ready to take on something that was going to make a difference. And um, I remember one of our early conversations with our other roommate when they were still both Republicans and I, I was uh, talking about, um, and they were talking about welfare and whether welfare was a good idea. And I said, well, actually, I think we had welfare on the farm. It was just called farm subsidies. So um, I was already in a frame, had, had gone to my local library and read Another Country by James Baldwin. I don't know what, you know, you don't know what leads you in those directions, uh, but exactly, but you, but I was really clear. Now, what did Washington feel like? As Hope said, we used to march out of our dorm and just take on the city, go places, bookstores and museums and any place we could get to and try and figure out what was going on. And it was freedom. It was uh, like, what's, what's new? Right. And um, yeah. that was a pretty exciting sort of feel. Um, the feel at the university was a little more, for me, wasn't as open-ended. I was in a very white, very male history department. And uh, I remember knowing later that they didn't help me learn how to have ideas. Uh, so that was, a, you know, that was the first, I didn't even know then that was sexism, but, <laughs> um, but I, I know I didn't talk in a class until I got to graduate school. <laughs> so given this introduction to Washington, D.C., that you both had in the mid-60s, one of the things were really heating up with the anti-war movement in particular, let's start talking about what are some of the things you did that were important to you in, the, in those years. Hope you go first. What would you say that? I, I think most of those early years just sort of set the stage for what was to come. I, I think actually then in terms of what I did, um, my, the guru of the anthropology department, the man whose courses I took, um, was a rebel and an iconoclast and unfortunately also a manic depressive. And in a, in a manic binge he announced to the Washington Post directly that all of his uh, freshman class was going, to fail, was going to get an A in his upper division class, which I'd already taken, so I wasn't directly involved in that sense, was going to fail. And this was his way of leveraging, he thought, um, a grading system that allowed more freedom. He, he, you know, he used to say they should just give us our degrees the first day we came, and then only people who wanted to learn would have to stick around. And He really did believe that, um, but the university didn't. And uh, they made a sham compromise and put him on a committee. And then after they'd, they'd kind of bought him off that way, they sent out a faculty mem memo saying, oh, well, you don't have to worry about Pat Gallagher anymore. We have him under control. And so he resigned because he was a proud Irishman. And uh, that was what we did. We, we collected thousands of signatures on the GW campus saying, please don't accept this resignation. And they did. And um, he taught one more course. Um, I guess he taught the second half of his introductory course. He taught one last course on witchcraft and sorcery, which was entirely focused on the Western world and 
what really was the thinking behind witchcraft. He announced on the first day that there weren't going to be any midterms and at the end of the year we could all submit whatever we thought was an appropriate response to the course. Mm -hmm. And every single lecture had more people in it than were actually signed up for the class. And um, I was stunned when they fired him, mm -hmm. you know. And it, that was the only, I mean, I went to the anti-war marches, you know, I went to the occasional SDS meeting, but this was the moment when I just said, my God, the institutions that I thought were so important are not what I thought they were. So I think that was a real turning point for me. Eye opener. Yeah. And how about you, Linda? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I've always thought, that looking back, we sort of stumbled through things. We didn't actually know what we were doing, but we had a basic kind of um, a moral, we were driven by a moral purpose uh, uh, that we kept going back to that had to do with, uh, you know, what, what we thought America should be. And um, so that, I, that sounds grandiose now, but I know that was on my mind from reading Chardin to, read, to thinking about history uh, to, um, to being involved in what was prior to Roe v. Wade. So there were really sort of three things in those early years that were interesting to me. I'd always started tutoring. So I was busy tutoring in the community, uh, both in Denver and here. Um, I was now involved in the, the change, you know, the post um, uh, John Paul, or um, John the 23rd. All the folk masses. Yeah, all the folk masses. <laughs> um, I was also, um, uh, you know, we had women in our circle. I mean, it was the advent of the pill, um, you know, going to Dr. Titus. Um, <laughs> uh, but also this notion that if somebody got pregnant, they still were in the midst of a mess. Um, you know, our other roommate who is not here had a terrible experience with that. And we had women visiting us yeah. to try to get their psychological papers together to get abortions. So we, you know, we didn't actually, hadn't set foot fully in the women's movement yet, but we were trying to navigate this new territory of the, the sexual revolution, the, the abortion situation. So the, the women's things we were moving towards, um, you know, culminated in the early 70s and meetings and, and other things. Uh, we were starting to go to these, having arguments about the war and starting to go to meetings and yeah. then we, by senior year, we were occupying one of the, the halls at GW because of their horrible, uh, I mean, we, on the surface was the Dow Chemical stuff, but underneath of that, later we learn it's much more uh, complicated than that about GW's involvement with uh, the Army and so forth. Right. So, so um, we knew that things were wrong and we were preparing ourselves to do these things that we had never even thought about before. I didn't, I mean, we'd heard about the South and the Civil Rights Marches when we were looking at the news, but I'd never yeah. been in one. Right. And so um, this notion of uh, going against the mainstream became what, you know, it just became what we thought about and did and were sure that we were very right about it. So, um, and then after we finished GW, I, I entered the teaching in, G in, in DC. So that was huge. When I walked into the classroom, the first classroom of my mentor teacher and the Black Panther posters were everywhere. Um, and we had this permission to actually enter into a different kind of teaching and thinking and being with students and uh, so forth. Um, I was also uh, required to teach um, the African empires, which I knew nothing about, nada, um, and was then angry about my own education. So all of this, you know, it sort of revolves in, in, in tandem into a, um, 
you know, I, I like to say when I came to Washington, I had these lovely, um, lovely matching bras and slips, which were thrown out by 1967. <laughs> and we were on the street, you know, and that's, we stayed there for a long time. Yeah. And took our, ch then started to take our children by the end of the 70s. Yeah. That's how we raised them. Yeah. So. I would say that all that led up with me to really wanting to find out what the rest of the world was like. And, and so my actually last semester of college I spent in Quito, Ecuador. And, and that, I thought I was prepared to find out what the world was like. And, and I discovered that I, I wasn't. That the world was so much more unjust than I had ever even imagined. When, when I would come downstairs and there would be families going through the trash cans in front of the building that I lived in looking for food. Or, or, or the, the baby coffins. There was a coffin store between where I lived and where I went to school. And, and it had these windows of coffins. They are displayed in Latin American cities, not sort of hidden the way we do. And there were all these little teeny, like, doll coffins. And for quite a long time, I was assuming they were like those little tents in Walmart or something where you can see the model of the big tent on top of the shelf. And gradually I understood that these were just for children who were dying at that point in time when you have to make the transition from breast milk to the water and sanitary conditions of the, wherever you are. And that's when children die in huge numbers. Did you make the connection in Quito uh, about what happens there in American policy? Or was that something that came later? That, oh no, that, that, that I was in Quito when Rockefeller came to visit, in fact. Um, and in some measure, I'm sure of sadism. Nixon decided, of all people, to send to South America Rockefeller, who, you know, he, you know basically owned Venezuela. Uh, and uh, we were in school at, at classes, and someone stood up and told us that uh, Rockefeller was coming that afternoon, and they expected there to be riots at the university. And so we should stay away from it. And, and my roommate and I looked at each other and said, shall we go right now or will we wait till our glasses are over? So we, we went, so yes, we, we, had, we had put that together. We had come to the conclusion that it would take a revolution to change what was wrong with Ecuador. Um, we spent quite a while trying to find people who um, agreed with that position. And they were very hard to find in Quito. Even the, we had even kind of gotten far enough that the student revolutionaries of the, of the university in Quito, we could tell there were major problems with their political view when they decided that peasants weren't an important part of their program, but they should be working with the proletariat, which was fine, except there wasn't one in Quito. Yeah. But yeah, it, that was when, I, I didn't know exactly how the answer would come, or maybe exactly what it would be, but at that point, that was the point at which I realized it was going to take really massive change from below to, to make some place like Ecuador a more just place. And then when I came back to the mm -hmm. States, I would say I realized that a great deal of that also applied to the States. Mm -hmm. But I think I learned it abroad in some ways before I really fully appreciated it in my own country. Well, that's, it, it brings to mind um, watching um, the People's Park uh, helicopters from Reagan on television and how angry we were senior year of college. I mean, just yeah. livid. And then, you know, later understanding that this man became not only governor of a state, but president. And now we're in the midst of this craziness um, for this election. And it is so h hard to recognize that we that you know we seem to take a step forward and then we'll take steps back and that whole thing you start to see by the time you get to be our age and worry if we've um, and, and not left the world a better place not in the usual economic terms about will our children have a better life but is it a more just place for people um, 
And that still is of enormous concern, but it started by seeing these things that were like, really, you can't be serious. We can't, right. Right. why are we doing this? In any place, shape, or form, um, you know, I mean, so, so, and those conversations, mm -hmm. now that Hope's awareness came to be, no. <laughs> <laughs> But also, uh, you know, Mary Jo's, by that time, she was studying Gramsci at, right, at Georgetown. Yeah, that's right. So we, masters yeah, about it. we are, we are um, sort of on a journey together. I was very, very so fortunate that I had, this is, does not happen in Aurora, Nebraska, that you get two people who can accompany you, too. So my two best friends from second grade were also on the same journey in other places. So... All of this was mounting, you know, and it felt like the, the streams of the feminism and the experiences we had there with the early um, abortion issues and all of that and the, and, the, and the, you know, getting up the courage to fight, uh, to have the meetings at GW, to sit in, to say, no, we're not going to class until this changes. Um, and then the education piece, where I was experiencing urban poverty and, and racism in ways that I had never had experiences in in Nebraska, where there was nobody to experience it with. I mean, uh, so, or, or at least in the town I lived in, in Omaha and Lincoln, perhaps. But um, so all of those, those things had the same genesis. And you mm -hmm. began to understand the institutional piece that yeah. kept things in place for an elite and, um, and privileged me. And then as I got on in education, this whole notion of how I represent and am a, my identity politics is that, you know, I'm a white female with a lot of privilege and what was my responsibility in that discourse, in that dialogue, in those places and spaces. Um, so um, all of that, contributed to building up through the the late 60s and early 70s into a place where you had a firm a very firm grip on the fact that these are the people you wanted as friends this is what you wanted to do and uh, and we were going to just all do it together it felt to me the things that you're saying also it came together little piece by piece, different yes. things happening in different spheres of your life. But it was also kind of important to be situated in one of the major cities yes. where there was this kind of consciousness that would be Washington, New York, San Francisco, Chicago, a few other places that somehow had populations and universities big enough to see show these contradictions where they were. Yes. You know, um, you're saying and that you didn't have anyone to talk about some of this stuff in Nebraska. It's got to be true for a lot of people. But it was also a privilege to be sort of at the center of the world in those years. Exactly. You know, um, and you have, you know, I remember thinking early on, probably um, the big anti-war uh, demonstration, you know, the biggest one we were at to that point in yeah. the fall of 1969. Yeah, 500,000 people. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. Yes. Yes. I remember thinking, aren't we? lucky we're here yeah, yeah. because they all come here yeah. now right. and I then I've had a second question to myself if I had to travel as often as these all these other people would do we would we would we have made but we realized we we would do it in a second by yeah, the early yeah. 1980s we were in Greensboro you know as yeah. as soon as that mess happened in Greensboro we were there so it wasn't, or we were in New York for anti-nuclear, or we were, you know, whatever. Whatever it took, we realized by that point we had the commitment to go there. But early on, it, you're right, place um, was critical and because there was a focus here. I, th I think for me, too, place after, after being in Ecuador, um, I, I, I wasn't ready for life in the United States again. I wasn't as, as focused in that way as, as Linda. So I ended up with a girlfriend and a Toyota Land Cruiser and drove to Chile. And then there I was. I mean, I arrived in March of 1970, you know, six months before Salvador Allende was elected. And in terms of a 
social and political laboratory and mass movement, it was the, a part of my life I'll, I'll certainly never, ever forget. And, and as I tried to figure out my place in that, um, I ended up working for an Allende government women's magazine. That was kind of my entry into trying to explain what I sort of already understood about feminism to a socialist model world that had not really considered it at all. And um, some, somehow through a letter to the editor to this magazine, I ended up um, and recruited other people to work with me doing an adaptation of Our Bodies Ourselves for this magazine, which involved all kinds of really wonderful experiences and, and learning from our own naivete at the same time. Like we went, we wrote the chapter on birth control, you know, and we had some biases against um, the inner uterine devices. I think that the troubles with the Dalcon shield were already mm -hmm. known at that point. This would have been 1972-ish. Yeah, yeah, and um, so we knew that they pre presented a risk to fertility for um, you know, young women who had never been pregnant and things like that. And we were trying to hash through what to say about all this. And we interviewed the, help, the head of um, obstetrics and gynecology for the Chilean National Health Service. And sort of we're trying to share our reservations. And he looked at us and he said, Did you speak Spanish when you went yeah. down there? Well, I learned it. Wow. By then I did, yeah. How on earth did you get a job at a magazine, though? That sounds, in a new country where you... Well, we did. We, 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 um, we wrote it, but we had, we had a lot of women working with us, and we certainly had somebody editing our Spanish, um, because we did write it in Spanish. But that kind of prose is not hard to write, um, actually. That's what I used to teach children with, you know, factual stuff in the present days. But um, he said, we don't see any women who haven't been pregnant. We said, you don't? No, he said, they don't come to us until after they've had a pregnancy they don't want. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, that wasn't, we were imagining, you know, some entirely lovely different world about there. This is in the middle of the socialist government. But, but anyway, that, that ended and I came back to Washington. And when did you come back to Washington? 1973. 73. And, and sort of that was the, that began the era that I was principally an activist Did you come in Washington. Before, back before or after the coup? I came up here in September of 73. And the coup was that I month? Was, the coup was in September. Right. 11th. Um, so we'll you had just think left? there's a reason for that. Yeah. Um, other day. Actually, I had come to introduce my infant son to family and stuff mm -hmm. in, in late June of that year. Mm -hmm. And by the time we would have gone back, we knew that it was just a matter of days. Mm -hmm. And we set a cutoff date, my husband and I. And if it hadn't snapped by then, we'd go back. And if it had, we'd look and see what happened. So I mean, the magazine that I wrote, wrote for no longer existed. The literacy project that my husband worked for no longer existed. Um, so we stayed here, and, and I got involved in, in uh, human rights work around Latin America. Because of the Chile experience. Because of Chile. And, and what's the link that you made between Chile and South Africa a little later on? Tell us about that. Oh, well. I don't, I didn't personally make the link, but they were a growing force in town. Um, the the anti-apartheid people, yeah. Yeah, and I think June 16th is the anniversary of um, uprisings in Soweto. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it was the moment when, when, you know, apartheid was, actually did fall and not so long after that. And um, I guess we had gone to some of their events and Somehow we entered into long discussions. These went on for weeks between um, Non-Intervention in Chile, which is the group I work with, and the June 16th Coalition about could we do an event together. They were really weird. I wanted you to talk a little about that coalition in Washington, D.C., the June 16th Coalition, for people who don't know about it. I mean, how did that happen? I don't know how it got started. It was well established when we linked up with them, but I think it began it with university students. Mm -hmm. And I, I think perhaps it started at Howard and places and spread so that it was a coalition. It involved all kinds of black organizations in, this, in the city, but the leadership seemed fairly studentish to me. Um, 
And they were not really at all convinced that it would be a great idea to hold some big public event with a bunch of Latin American and, and uh, you know, white activists. And I mean, it was very divided. I mean, if you were a white lefty in those years in Washington and you lived as I did in Mount Pleasant or Adams Morgan or something, it was, it was a contradiction after, after, over which eventually we disbanded our organization. I mean, what the hell were we doing? We're sitting in the middle of what was then a black city trying to sell people on the idea that they should actually care about something that happened 10,000 miles away in a country they probably couldn't find on a map. You know, that we were always acutely aware of this and, and eager to find some way that we could build bridges with um, somebody outside of that world. And, and the June 16th coalition obviously was. So we did. We put on the only event I can remember from those years that was that was a fully integrated event at, at All Souls Church. And Bernice Reagan, you know, she got mad at us because we, the way we organized it was this, you know, keep everybody bored with the speeches, but don't let the artists come out till the end mm -hmm. so they won't leave. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I remember, I mean, it was, we were just crying. We started out with all the members of Sweet Honey sitting in different places at All Souls Church and then gradually standing up and walking down the aisle and, and finishing their song. And um, we did a wonderful slideshow about the parallels between Chile and South Africa. And it didn't last much beyond that event, but it was, it was one of the only things of its kind that, that I can ever remember in the city then. Yeah. Coalition things were always hard in the 60s and 70s because it, it was it seemed like it was competing just injustices you know yeah in, in fact they had a lot of the same source but those things were yeah. sometimes hard and disappointing you know I they mean, were tough the toughest yeah. ones were the Iranians yeah we had a lot of trouble figuring that one out we assigned one of our members to study it thoroughly and give us a report because mm -hmm. there were like four groups and they were always asking us to endorse their groups and we kept saying, well, when you get together, that was what we finally said. When, when all these four groups here get together and they're one coalition, then we'll, we'll sign, but we're not going to make a decision about which of four competing Iranian student organizations we should be, you know, throwing our, you know, really actually, you know, pretty... <laughs> small amount of influence um, mm -hmm. into. But, but yeah, we were the model for, I think, really, I mean, a lot of our members, as we dissolved, ended up working with um, organizations focused on Nicaragua and El Salvador. And if, if you look at all those groups, you'll, you'll see that the origins of a lot of it are, are with Chile. Really? And from there, it spread out. Yeah. Now, why do you think the Chile thing was so dominant and so pervasive? I mean, it's a relatively underpopulated country, you know, I mean, it, it, there never were that many Chileans, as many as there were countries, you know, well, populations well, of bigger countries. Why were they so influential? Well, first, it's the only freely elected socialist yeah. government yeah. Yeah. that there's practically ever been on the planet. Mm -hmm. So that alone drew people from all over the world, to went to Chile. I, I didn't go there with a, you know, I didn't go there because of it. I, I was there before it happened. But many, many people went because of it. Mm -hmm. Academics, activists, Phil you know, Phil Oaks was there, Jerry Rubin was there, Angela Davis's sister was there, um, Ralph Abernathy came one day for a march. Um, uh, there were organizations, you know, the, and then there were the Brazilians because things were not good in Brazil, and then when things got worse in Argentina, we had the Argentines, so there was, you know, it was a, a very, and, and Chileans were, and are, very politically sophisticated. So unlike a lot of other countries, I think, I got to be judged by who I was rather than, um, well, you can't work with us, you're a Yankee imperialist. Um, and then, you know, a lot of them came <clears throat> out of Chile after the coup, forced or, or fleeing or refugees. Um, at some point there were estimates that 10 percent of the population of Chile had, had expatriated mm -hmm. or been kicked out. Um, and, and the abuses were just, you know, spectacularly horrible at the beginning. I, I used to look at people and tell them, well, if we, we know so many, let's say 10,000 people were killed in and around the time of the coup. Now imagine that you're going to multiply that by, what, 30 or 40? 
Mm. What would we feel like if half, you know, practically half a million people yeah. got gunned down? Mm -hmm. um, so I think I think it's all that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, um, there's a wonderful book called Pinochet and rewritten by Mark Cooper, and I think he says something like, "Chile was the high point of the of the world student movement at some point." I'm glad to hear you say that, yeah, because as we do this interview, of course, we're all in the middle of a week of commemoration of the killing of a Chilean diplomat wow. here in Washington, D.C., yes. named Orchando, Orlando Otelier and Ronnie Moffat, his assistant. Um, it's the 40th anniversary of their murder, and yes. we're all going tomorrow to the Chilean embassy where the ambassador, Juan Valdez, who was jailed by um, Pinochet, is... Uh, is inviting us in for hors d'oeuvres after the commemoration of this terrible murder. So yeah, we're very Chile conscious strange. and there's lots of people here for it, right? Yes. But that explains it, what you said. I always wondered why it was so influential, right? As a, what, yeah. There's so many things that happened in so many different countries, but that seems to be everybody remembers what yeah. happened in, in Chile. Yeah. So yeah, I was really in the long happy. run, the good guys won in Chile. Of course, that's never very, for very long, but I don't know if we can even say the good well, better than won. I think we could say the torture was ended. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we could say that people aren't disappearing anymore. I think we could say you can, you know, you can have your own newspaper. Yeah. But. But well, it's, it's not. We as can't say that it was one. Well, yeah. some things were. Chile has the the yeah. most exaggerated inequality of distribution of yeah. income practically in the whole continent now. And they've managed to make all the poor people live so far away from the city that you don't yeah. see them. So there's a lot that remains the same or worse, right? right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, I still love it, but one of my friends who went back after 20 years, who was there during the Indian government, said, boy, this is a country that lost its soul. Mm -hmm. Well, there are, there are certain things that happen when uh, you, uh, and I hope we're not going to be experiencing that in the next four years here. But there are certain things that happen in cultures, and they can never go back to where they were. For instance, what do you think? Well, I remember um, hearing uh, how things were in Chile. We, I, I didn't go down until 1988. Uh, but there was a, a break in the culture yeah. after that that has never I, I would say never changed. I mean, the the and and we're not going to go back to that. I mean, you don't go back when you make um, certain choices and certain things happen that put families on different, uh, totally different sides of a political um, situation, like uh, that definitely did in Chile or or other places. We 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 actually have a hard time. Um, and there, it's not like we should go back to some great thing that was before. It wasn't that, you know, there were s serious issues, you know, with the Mapuches or with, with the distribution of income. And, but they certainly, um, the culture is never, th is never quite the same again. I mean, we're, we're seeing now that for a while they could hold it together in South Africa. And, you know, it just is, ret you know, we're just constantly I mean I don't know how we're gonna how you how you heal uh, and we are seeing that in the United States now we have never ever ever settled the issue of how awful this country started in terms of slavery and um, as as um, um, the Equal Justice Institute guy um, Brian Stevenson says, it, you know, there, it's not like there were different things. It's a one long stream of slavery to lynching to mass incarceration to to uh, killing, you know, young men and and boys on um, and older men too on the streets of of our cities by police. So we have never settled that. And and when you don't settle something about your historical um, atrocities. Um, and that's still probably the case in, in a lot of places. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I would, you know, that's, that's what has motivated me this, this entire time to stay in education, actually. And, and, and really, 
Then you really, need to teach the um, next generation? I, well, I, what, what do you think? I'm well, sorry. You, you, how do you, how do you, uh, how, what do you mean about, are you teaching the next generation? Is that the yes, specific Yes, teaching the next generation. And, and my battle the last um, 15 years has been against the neoliberal neo agenda in education, or since probably the early 90s, actually. And, and what it is doing to damage the democracy. Let's talk so about that some. I, you know, that goes back to that speech I wrote in high school. Like, what if, what do we, if we do this to achieve more uh, democratic equality? I mean, almost everybody who thinks in education is, is looking at how we have completely eliminated the, the, um, the, the democratic equality or civic goals of education, and we are only focused on the economic goals and social efficiency and social mobility for some and college and career readiness for everybody but it really only includes some and so um, that neoliberal agenda ha is has and the charter schools and 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 have and the market driven ways we are approaching educational reform have have been um, you know, I'm not sure we can recover a public school system that has been in this country since the middle of the 1800s uh, so that we can actually prepare citizens to live in a democracy. So that's, you know, I, that's, <laughs> frankly, that's why I'm still working after all these years. It's, um, a, it's a constant. It's I a, mean, yeah. I, so. yeah. Well, I've worked on this at the individual level of actually teaching children. Uh -huh. for a long time and and then I retired from that but 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 on the school board um, it's the way that this the charter schools have been given carte blanche to do we have 28 no we have more than that we have about what was it a hundred and something children in charter schools in our district 118, I think. Um, two or three of them are brick and mortar, uh, perhaps innovative educational ideas, and I'm not entirely against them. Then we have all these cyber charter schools. They, they have no, there's like no regulation of what they're doing at all. Yeah. They're completely unsupervised. Um, and they're terrible. Even, even by the standards that the advocates of charter schools claim is what we should be judging them by, they're worse. Mm -hmm. Because there's, there's no human interaction. Nobody even knows actually if the children are actually doing any of it or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just them and the computer and parents who probably aren't in the house. Um, we've tried to create some kind of quasi-public approach to, to that because there are sometimes legitimate reasons for children not to come into schools, but um, it's, um, it eats into the budget, it eats into any effort to, <clears throat> I mean, it's, public schools have the ability to be the one democratizing institution of our country. And, and yeah, we're in the process of seeing that that's getting that's lost. Involved. Even our, even our, you know, I mean, our Democratic yes, they get candidates, it. they're not much better. They, they, they just rolled over. Yeah, they don't seem to get it. Um, I, I, my daughter, who I'm proud of the legacy of activism, who's a teacher, you know, she read an interview with Obama where she was just, Horrible. I've never seen her so pissed in my life. <laughs> because he, he, he explained why his children were going to sit well friends and all the things that were wonderful about sit well friends yes. while simultaneously maintaining a policy of something entirely different for the rest of the nation's yeah. children. You know, and that's that's going on. It's uh, I think education is a real I can't it's help really but think, a fundamental battleground. Uh, I can't help but thinking, you know, you you're both teachers and worked as teacher. I've never worked as a teacher, but um, so much of what you do is still rooted in this idea that we had in the 60s and it was around before then that that 
you know, schools are democratic institutions yes. and they're fair and they should be. And I think when we were going to school, they probably were a little more fair in lots of ways. Of course, we're all white, so. Yeah. But but there, th those ideas of fairness and justice and constitutional rights and, per and human rights that are supposed to be part of our country's, you know, aura um, are being, I, I, I and they're just being trashed by this privatization of schools, this whole this whole thing that you're talking about, the mm -hmm. neoliberal agenda. And this the huge market. Um, I mean, when they discovered in the 80s how much money schools had and right. these textbook companies and the testing companies and the, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a huge business. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so, but, but along with, you know, going back to the sort of roots of that 60s to 75, we learned what collective spirit was. And we knew somehow that yes. this tension in America between individualism and collectivism was a continuing tension. We want individual liberties, but not to the expense of what we can do to move together collectively. And we, that was the, the n nucleus of our understanding how to work together collaborate, have tensions and disagreements and conflicts, but move, on, move an agenda forward. Yeah. That is not what is happening now, and that is, is going to be to our larger detriment. Yes. Uh, we're trying to move back to that in some places with certain yeah. practices, but if we continue down this road um, in education as well as other things, we, we have a, a really serious problem on of our hands. And, and we know historically hanging on to a democracy is not that easy. Not easy. And, and, and I, yeah, and I get surprised. I have to realize sometimes that those values and, mm -hmm. and, and ability to you know, pull things together with a group is not something that most people have, right. even in our generation. Right. And, and I realized that we all learned that. As we learned that, yes. You know, and we learned, you know, at the simplest, silliest level. Yeah. Um, the idea property. that, oh, well, last, last week we're going to do this, then we're going to have, you know, 150 people and make dinner. Yeah. I mm. can say that to my university friends in Pennsylvania. They go, what? Yeah. Yeah. You're going to figure out how to make dinner for, well, of course you are. You know, we've yeah. done it lots of times. We've done it lots we've of times. We've brought time. people together. We, you know, that's. One thing that, that one thing that we haven't talked too much about in this interview or previous interviews is, the, uh, you know, that group groupness that you're talking about. Group living was so big yes, in those years. Exactly. That, you know, one of the things that I that I tell young activists when I see them these days is that somehow we all managed to carve out time to right. do political work. And it was mostly because we lived five or six people in a house at fifty dollars a pop for each yeah. one. You know, you could afford you could afford to do that. Mm -hmm. You could have a half time job and it wasn't so expensive because you right. shared a house and food and meals with people. Yeah. That still remains true today for people who, you know, try to do this kind of work they end up in group living situations although even that got much more expensive right. but we we really had i think the benefit of something good there uh, yes. when there was a lot of houses for rent and <laughs> people yes. didn't mind five or six people moving in i missed uh, that yeah i missed that too but i i have raised my last two children you know in the nuclear family model and i think it's really not what I would choose. It's not adequate. It's okay, but it's, it's not okay, adequate. But really, right. it's much better if there's five adults and two kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, on Klingle Road, there were five adults and two kids, and then the weekly food budget was $15, and kids didn't have to pay. <laughs> <laughs> well, but they I, ate all the little yogurts. Yeah. How far are we in? We're up to 15 minutes. Okay, good. I think you've almost answered one of the questions that we always do with this interview is that how, how does this work influ mm -hmm. influence the rest of your lives? You sort of answered that already, but is there anything else that you want to, I mean, you both stayed with teaching and education in general, and, and you and wrote, wrote a book also, helps, yeah. right? Uh, is, there, is there anything else that you want to say about how these, these wonderful activities of your youth affected the rest of your life. Yeah, um, I think Lynn and I both had a response to this. You go first, because mine was totally different than yours. Yeah. What was mine? I don't remember now. I don't what's, what's your response? Well, I, you know, now it's probably different than I was saying before. Um, I'm, I am committed, to, uh, you know, I, uh, I've been wanting to do, could devote myself to some kind of art project for the rest of my life. 
um, because I didn't really get to do that while I was doing all this education work. Um, and uh, I have, uh, I do think that the racial healing piece in this country is an enormous responsibility. M my daughter identifies as African American. She's out in the community organizing and uh, through the arts. And, uh, you know, she's, uh, she came to me yesterday and said, 11 of the, the new principals in, the, in, in wards five and six are all white. And that would not have, ha you know, the black leaders that I grew up with um, in the schools the, at, and at the Urban League where I worked, um, I didn't have a white boss till I w was well in, you know, almost 15, 20 years into my career. All of that makes a huge difference in terms of the, the things I want to do before I leave the planet, which are devote myself in some way to uh, making sure that um, if I should be lucky enough to have grandchildren, we're not having to tell those, uh, you know, those young men, if, if boys or girls, that they can't have, you know, they have to watch out for this. They have to look over their shoulder for that. I'm just like up to here with, uh, with that. So I'm, I have started this, um, and I'm pretty far into an art project that is um, using quilting as a medium to um, commemorate all the people who have been lynched in America, hoping that through the arts we can have a redemptive spirit that might, you know, a collective redemptive spirit. This is not the only thing. I mean, they're doing the memorial in Montgomery. I've got a colleague in California who's doing, uh, who's um, memorializing all the lynchings in California through photography. We need a, a, a moment in this time for truth and reconciliation. And uh, we, the Black Lives Matter movement has pushed that forward. So now, what else can everybody do to make sure that we don't go into this next generation with this, this, and we didn't take action now. We didn't step up and say, we're gonna be different as a country. So that's sort of my, through education or the arts or whatever you can do to make that happen. Racial healing. Yeah. I, I think the lesson that I've learned from it all that I find most Americans don't appreciate is the fragility even of what we do have. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we're all becoming a little more aware of that this year with Donald Trump. Um, I mean, if, if we needed someone to show us that the idea that it can't happen here, he's certainly doing that for us. But whether we really understand that well enough to keep it from happening. Um, I mean, I, you would tell people about what happened in Chile, which just really had, up until this horror, one of the two or three most democratic histories of the continent. And most Americans would kind of think, oh, well, you know, that's one of those third world banana republics. There's yeah. nothing like that would ever happen here. Well, it will happen here if we're not careful. There's no reason it won't happen here. I honestly believe that our institutions that preserve democracy are weaker in their support of democracy than Chile's were. I mean, by the time Chile snapped, um, you know, we were all living in a war zone. Um, I mean, there was tear gas on the streets every day. Um, you know, we had half a million people could be mobilized to march in a few hours' notice. You know, I mean, it was, you could feel the tension in the air. It was so thick you kind of had to plow through it. So you knew, you know. But I have no faith at all that that couldn't happen in this country. And, and I think it's really important for us to understand that. And I, I guess I wrote the book in part because of that feeling that people had to Let's see. Let's talk a little about your book. Tell us about your book. Well, it was just a story of, it was a story, it was sort of a coming of age story, I think, mm -hmm. of little essays, but how gradually I became part of a very different world than I'd started out in, and what I learned um, from being in Latin America along the way. But I'll, I'll tell you one story that's kind of a, 
not about Chile. It was the only one I wrote about the years, practically when I was here, in between the two sets of years living in Chile, it was an, a lecture by the leading light of one of the Maoist organizations in town when they were like really in. And there were like 500 people somewhere listening to this guy. And, and China had a particularly, uh, nobody who cared about Chile would have anything to do with it. I mean, they, they didn't take in any refugees. They were one of the first countries to ref, actually recognize the junta as a legitimate government in Chile. You know, so we all had their number pretty clearly. And I had decided I wasn't going to ask any questions because I would just get hysterical. And then uh, Fred Soloway, he asked a question. And you should interview him too. Um, and the guy didn't answer it. So that was it for me. So I stood up and, you know, accused them of supporting this and how could they possibly justify not allowing people into their embassy. And he said, well, they were revisionist. And I said, how did they know? You know, they even had Maoists in Chile. Maybe they were all Maoists. <laughs> you know, I know it's just completely livid, but what was weird about that was that afterwards, all these people would see me at left events for the next year or two and say how brave I was to stand up to them. That maybe was the point where I decided I had to go back to Chile uh -huh. <laughs> because it really didn't require much bravery to get pissed at some stupid Maoist intellectual, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I went back to Chile where getting pissed had actual consequences. <laughs> Now, what's the what's the, the title of your book? I locos. I lo. Okay. I is the Spanish for there are. Oh, okay. And it's a double entendre. Um, okay. Locos are also a kind of abalone, but they also are crazy people. <laughs> That's one of the big lessons of the '60s, by the way. You know, getting drawn into very small circles which self-reinforce yes. themselves. Yes. yes. And, and, and let's that's talk about another lesson of the 60s you want to talk about. Yes, that, uh, I remember that. going um, um, when we, the, I think this was May of 1970 or was it 71? I can't remember. May Day. May Day. 71. 71. We were, um, oh yes, because I, I didn't, hadn't met Rick Reinhardt yet. So we were, I was teaching at Cardoza High School then, and we were, or, we were going to these meetings to organize. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we went to this meeting, and you know, from the meeting, which probably had a May Day meeting, a May Day meeting, meeting right. and we, uh, there were probably infiltrators there, I don't have any idea, but uh, the next, you know, we had all these ways we were going in the street the next, day, or the next whatever day we were going out there, May Day. Um, and, um, I was just horrified that we got shut down so fast and arrested so quickly. And I remember going up against this, you know, policeman on a horse and blah, 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 blah and all of this stuff, but boom. And it taught me this, Im this important lesson about how we can't get too internal. That, you know, you can get a group of people together and have this collective spirit to do X, Y, or Z. But you, there's a there's a kind of reinforcing um, part of that, without listening to the rest of what's going on around you. That that you have to do in order to make sure that whatever you think is tested against something else that's that's out there in the world, and you don't get too um, what's the word in, insular, yeah, insular in your yeah. in your um, thinking and and knowledge of what else is going on around you. Because, uh, I mean, May Day was not successful in the way we had hoped. And uh, that, was, that was a big lesson I've taken with me throughout this whole, this whole life. It's like, are we too insular here? What else, is, what else would be people be thinking if they were hearing us talk and so forth? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Any other uh, last thoughts about lessons that you learned? It seems like there's quite a lot of learning here, but anything that we needed to say before we close this interview? Well, I think we, uh, I had a conversation last night at this event with a woman who just got out of college who works for Code Pink. And the longer I talked to her, the further her jaw dropped. 
<laughs> and I think we need to tell these stories to young people. You yes. know, this is, uh, we need to say, don't be afraid to keep, keep on keeping on. I mean, we didn't know what we were doing all the time. We learned by doing. That's, you know, from yeah. my education background, that's a very dewy way of doing things. Learn from experience, build on it. But, um, I going where I yeah, go. make the path, the old Miles Horton thing, make the path by walking it, you know? I mean, if, you're, if you've been in Highlander, you know that that place is, uh, you know, you can create magic moments together, but then you have to go out in the world and you have to walk and talk your walk all the time and be sure you are ready to stand up not only uh, you know to the Maoist uh, intellectuals but to other people in small and large ways and how do you do that with courage and in a way that doesn't just get people like it mm -hmm. with each other mm -hmm. yeah any last thoughts from you boy I don't know um, it's it's I, I think the important thing is that our children, mm -hmm. you know, learn from all this and, and that we understand that we're also part of the wider world, wider than our friendships, wider than our class or our race or our nationality. And, and that's something I've I mean, after living in Chile and Washington, I ended up in the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania. And I would say that a lot of the last years of my life have been how not to be this exotic, like, you what? <laughs> you know, you had to leave Chile because the secret police were after you? Your friends, you know, got murdered and tortured? And here we are, you know, teaching Latin at Penn State. I, <laughs> I wasn't teaching Latin. Actually, one of my dear friends was. But, you know, like, what, what can we bring from this experience to pass on to our children and to pass on to a, a, a communities that aren't accustomed to this kind of experience? And we have to keep working on that. So we close with a question. How do we do that? So... Thank you, Linda, and thank you, Hope. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Eddie. Yes. <laughs> Very good, Eddie. <laughs>